Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. Yo, it's your bro, Yo Elliot, and that's how many of you know me. Been around for a while, and it's the first time I'm doing an actual podcast. I've been kind of resistant to doing this for a long time because I got an attitude. I like to not do the things that everybody else does, so I drag my feet on doing things that are popular. And podcasts have been popular for a long time, and it doesn't seem like it's going to go anywhere. So here I am. We're going to do this. And I figure, well, I'm going to shoot from the dome today. I'm just going to say what comes to my mind. And I guess the best place to begin would be why. Why am I here? What are we doing? So to be completely transparent, I don't know. I began making YouTube videos back in 2006 when YouTube first came out. And I had no idea what I was doing. I have no idea what I'm doing now. The difference being that was back in the baby days of the Internet. Can you believe that? when YouTube first came out. And so I had no expectation for what would proceed. I made those videos because guess what? I'm a strength coach and I wanted people to come to my strength camp. I wanted to come to work out with me and the way I uh, advertise my strength camp training programs was by making YouTube videos that the guys that were training with me could then share with their friends. So we were doing workouts out in the park so for those of you who don't know who old Uncle Yo is, I've been around a long time. Uh, strong man, strength coach, and owner of Strength Camp Gym, which, boy, I'll have to bring you up to date on what's been going on with Strength Camp. But if you go to YouTube and you look up Strength Camp, that's me. 1.8 million subscribers because I got pretty popular when uh, you could ride the YouTube wave. You see how today with TikTok, all you got to do is make a couple – popular TikToks and the algorithm grabs you like a uh, like a wave, a tsunami, and you can have a million views in a matter of days. So back in the day with YouTube, uh, there weren't very many boats in the ocean. And so I was one of the first. And so the, gray, the, the wave grabbed me. And by 2013, I had over a million subscribers on YouTube talking about what? How to become the strongest version of yourself. So we started with strength. Like I said, I'm a strength coach. And so my objective has been and is today to make men strong. And in the most obvious sense possible, right? If you're weak, you're skinny, you're flaccid and soft, you got to lift. And I think what made my lifting channel a little bit more popular than, say, some of the others or unique, let me put it that way, because there have been some really great ones. Unique was that, well, number one, I did strongman training and filmed those videos before strongman training was a big thing. So you can go to every flimsy slapdick gym in the world today and you'll find a tire. Uh, people are lifting sandbags. They're doing sled drags. They're doing all kinds of strongman type stuff. Well, I was one of the first guys online picking up Atlas stones and flipping tires and dragging sleds and pushing cars and doing these wild, odd object workouts at a time when most people were just playing with barbells. And so I guess it was sort of entertaining to watch this uh, hybrid meathead, me, uh, lift heavy stones. And so I started inviting people to my gym and you get to watch them lift stones too. And it almost became like a sort of rites of passage, an initiation process to go to strength camp and lift stones with old Uncle Yo. Well, I call myself old Uncle Yo, but I was Yo Elliot back then because I was only about 32 years old when that all started. I'm 43 now, and so I do refer to myself as old Uncle Yo because I seem to have found myself in a place of eldership amongst an entire generation of young men who now, well, whether they like it or not, 
would be lumped into a category called the manosphere, right? Oh boy, where are we going with all this? What is the manosphere? I don't even like that term, but it's the one that's been used uh, to describe this, I don't know, masculine awakening that's been happening on the planet, mainly through the internet that has brought us the likes of guys like Andrew Tate. And he's very popular today. He seems to be carrying the load for uh, the generation today. Uh, being an OG in this space, I was very early in speaking to men in a way that empowered them, not just in body, but in mind, in heart, in soul, becoming what? The strongest version of yourself. I'm hollering at all my OG fans here when I say stuff like that, right? Become the strongest version of yourself. Do you remember young E talking about becoming the strongest version of yourself? And I had a method by which I would teach people to become the strongest version of themselves in my videos. You might remember the four layers of strength. Oh boy, we going back. So I don't know what to do here. Do I, do I take a step back and go down memory lane and begin to bring up old stuff that will, will strike a chord, will stimulate some good feelings and memories uh, about the golden age of YouTube and Strength Camp and Yo Elliot? Or do I traverse that mucky, dirty, dark, wet passageway that I've moved through over those past 12 years or so uh, to get where I am right now, where there are people who, um, dare I say, don't like me anymore. <laughs> so which one we want to talk about? We want to go back back in the day? Let's go back in the day. Let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the four layers of strength because the four layers of strength is a, how you would say, Christians say Christology. Do you ever hear that term? I'm a, I, I, I'm a born again, you might say. Born again Catholic. Is that Can that actually actually happen? Because we're, we're baptized at birth, so you're always a Catholic when you're baptized. But um, it's sort of a foreshadowing. That's what a Christology is. It's sort of a foreshadowing of much of what I talk about today. And so let's draw a contrast between the two and then I'll dive deep. What, what do you say? Four layers of strength slash king, warrior, magician, lover. Old Elliot, new Elliot. And you could probably mark that shift into new Elliot with my king uh, stance. And it's so funny because today that even the term, I almost want to stop using the word king because it's become kind of played out. But one of the things that I discovered about myself is that I usually am on the scene way earlier than people can grasp what I mean. And as a result, it doesn't take very long before it catches on, and now I'm out. And so it's almost like kind of played out at this point when people use the word king to describe a man. But I'll tell you what I mean, because most guys, when they talk in king, they don't even have the depth of meaning that I want to bring to that. So let's back up. ADD's kicking in today. Four layers of strength. Do you remember we talked about physiological, well, I don't even remember, neuromuscular strength. That was the first layer. First layer of strength. Oh, Uncle, you used to talk about neuromuscular strength, using big words. I like to use big words. It makes me sound smart. Neuromuscular strength was about how the nervous system and the muscular system work together in such a way as to produce power, to produce strength, to produce performance. But then it goes one step deeper, one layer deeper, which is... Physiological strength. Physiological strength is oh so much uh, more complicated. It's more associated with what people would call biohacking today. And when it came to physiological strength, oh, Uncle E was talking about things associated with sleeping patterns, right? Circadian rhythms, hydration, drinking enough water, uh, Thoughts and, and emotions, which go a little bit deeper. We'll get to that in a moment. Eating right, right? It's all of the things that you do outside of the gym to help that neuromuscular strength pop off. You want to be a great performer in the gym. You want to be a great performer on the field. 
You want to be a great performer in life, right? You want to be strong. My dad's 72 years old, and he still climbs up ladders carrying pallets of of uh, roof roofing roofing tiles, right? And uh, those are those are heavy ass pallets. My dad's 72 years old. He's still fr- real strong. What I'm saying is, if you want to be functional, if you want to be able, you want to do things like a man. That's the neuromuscular strength, but that's all fed by physiological strength, right? If you're not sleeping, you're not eating, you're not drinking right, you're not thinking right, you're not breathing right, who remembers breathing into your balls? Because that's what's next. Energetic strength. That was the third layer of strength. And energetic strength is where I introduced y'all to bioenergetics. Boy, y'all remember that? Been a long time since old uncle even talking about bioenergetics, but you remember? Breathe into your balls. Do you remember that wild ass video I created where I was jumping around and humping around and shouting and pounding my chest? Teaching you guys about bioenergetic catharsis and how, it's funny, I call them layers because they all work together. How the muscular system and the, and the, and the physiology of the body are manifestations of what's going on in the mind. Energetic strength has a lot to do with psychology, has a lot to do with uh, what Wilhelm Reich called character structure. Boy, I don't want to go too, too deep down that rabbit hole, but the body is the mind. The body is the mind, meaning that the body will show up, will look literally your posture, will look like the way you think. And you know this is true. How do you know this is true? Because all you have to do is, like I do right here, raise your arms up in a power posture, power posture, and you feel like a powerful man. You begin to frown, or you begin to round, or you begin to look down at the ground, you begin to feel brown, not so bright, right? And so we understand that the body is the mind in that regard, and so... With that spectrum, where do we go? Do you want to change your thoughts? Do you begin with the thoughts or do you begin with the body? Right? If it's a spectrum. I like to say, or I like to quote Einstein. He says, you can't solve the problem at the level at which the problem is created. If you're depressed, it's probably because your thinking is all jacked up. So do you fix your thoughts in order to change your life? Or do you work on the body to enhance your mind? So you could just imagine with these layers, the deeper we go, the, the deeper the rabbit hole, the wilder it is. Man, and I can rant, I could talk about these things all day. I guess that's a part of the reason why people listen to me. They enjoy hearing me. Uh, I like ideas. I like going deep. I like having fun with all the amazing things that the world has to offer. God is good. And that brings us to level four. Life mastery. But life mastery is just as is deep, but also mystical, far more existential than even the energetic and physiological, right? Because now we're talking about the spiritual. And this is where the journey it goes beyond the body, goes beyond the mind, goes beyond the emotion, it's spirit, it's God, it's the Imago Dei. You know what that word means, Imago Dei? Image of God. You and I are the image of God. You and I are called, we are invited to be kingdom citizens, citizens of God's kingdom, that Christ came to share the good news about. Oh boy, where do we want to go with this? So anyway, that's what people came to know me about. Talking about those four layers, that's how I became, you know, part of the reason why I became popular on YouTube as a fitness uh, as a fitness guy. And people even back then would say, oh, Elliot, why don't you just stick to fitness? Oh, Elliot, why are you going outside the realm of your expertise and talk about all these things that you're not uh, an expert in? Well, I'll tell you what, I have no problem admitting 
I'm a dilettante. I love dabbling with all types of ideas. I like learning about every aspect of what could possibly be a tool in my belt for growing the strongest self. How to become the strongest version of yourself, right? And being the image of God means that it's so damn expansive, bro. We can never know all there is to know. But I'm like a kid in the candy shop when it comes to expanding my mind and learning things and trying things out and, and putting on different costumes. You see, I'm wearing a brown shirt today. This is my monk. This is my attempt at monk Elliot. Spiritual Elliot, because I like the way the Franciscans dress. I should get one of these with a hood, <laughs> right? And I got my miraculous medal, and I got my crucifix. So I'm a player in the game of life, if you will. And if you like to play too, you like ideas too, you like wrestling with things, playing with things, expanding upon things, trying things out, tasting the various flavors that God has to offer while we live here, then you're going to enjoy this show. You're going to enjoy hanging out with me. You're going to enjoy my rants. You're going to enjoy my guests because I want to bring in a whole plethora of guests, but we'll see how that works. I'm kind of a lone eagle in a way. By the way, my first guest, we already recorded it. It's my dad, Edmund Hulse. And so if you want to know why I'm the way I am, you'll get to find out why, because he is my essence, or I am his essence, right? The man's essence is his seed, and I am the seed of the man that helped make me, right? And so are you. Boy, I want to talk about fatherhood. I'm a father. I'm a father of four children. I'm a husband. I want to talk about traditional family and marriage. And traditional masculinity is a means for bringing back this world from the fallen, degenerate, dejective, disgusting state we find ourselves in right now. And that's a rabbit hole in and of itself. So if you haven't figured it out, today is going to be sort of a conglomerate, a mishmash, a rant about all the things that I want to spill out to you, all the love I want to deliver to you, pour out to you through YouTube and this camera and mic. So that's old Elliot, but it's not, look like, it's not like that guy died. It's about growth. It's about growing stronger. It's about knowing where you were wrong, I was wrong, knowing where I was missing pieces, knowing where things could be better explained and understood. And so the four layers of strength is very, even though it goes pretty deep with life mastery and of course physiological strength, it's still pretty surface, right? Because we're still dealing with the flesh. Man, and there's so much beauty in the flesh. There's so much that could be expanded upon with the flesh. There's so much that we still don't even know as scientists with regard to how to maximize the power of our flesh. And God wants that. God wants you to be the strongest version of yourself because he wouldn't give you a tool so damn powerful if he didn't want you to maximize it. So I want to thank all my biohackers out there that have taught me things about, well, fasting. I got to say that fasting is probably the most powerful method, uh, medicine for maximizing the material strength of the body. And I mean like making it so that your body is a pure conduit of celestial electricity so that all the power and presence of our creator is present through your expression. So, but it's, but like I said, the beauty of life, the beauty of the body, the beauty of the body, theology of the body, all that, man, we got to circle back. But I went deeper over the years. <laughs> you want to go deeper with me? You want to go deeper with me? Let me take a sip of water and we'll be back with that. 
because there's so much to go. There's so many places to go. But I'm going to keep it focused on the on. I'm going to keep it focused on four. Four layers, and there's the four aspects of a man, the quadrated psyche, four. And then number four, look, man, I wrestle because I'm a Catholic, but I also see the value. I see the, I see the bits of truth in a lot of new age ideas. And numbers, man. We live in a world of patterns, man. We live in a fractal universe, man. You can't deny that. There are patterns. There's, there's sacred geometry. That's, there's laws, right? I don't know if you can call that new age. I think sometimes Christians call things new age because they're not willing to try to understand them. But I don't think, I don't think God wants us to be bereft of the understanding of the science of patterns and numbers and sacred geometry that's available in our world. Four, bro. I think, what's, what's a new age term for that? Uh, is my, they, get, they have a special name for like a number that's associated with you, right? It's like my spirit number. <laughs> I'm born in the fourth month. That's my spirit number. So we're going to talk a lot about these four things. I'm going to keep today focused on the power of four. How about that? Because we can go on and on and on about that and find great wisdom in that. We can find maps of meaning and, 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 and patterns of meaning in our life that can all be broken down into that quadration. Carl Jung called it, called, called, he said, God manifests himself in a quaternio, right? And man, I didn't even take my sip of water yet. The quaternio. And I've been wrestling with this a little bit, right? Because I'm a mind wrestler. I'm a thought wrestler. I'm an idea wrestler. Conceptor. I'm a conceptor. I like concepts. About how the trinity is also, can also be, can also be plugged into this quaternio even though it's only three. Oh, man but I don't want to confuse or piss anybody off just yet. So let me slow down and go back. So when we talk about four layers of strength being the first incarnation of the evolution that you see, where you find me today is speaking in terms of the four, uh, the four modes of being when it comes to the masculine psyche. So let me give some context. Carl Jung was a student of Sigmund Freud. And I'm not saying I'm a fan of Freud because I'm not. Uh, but he's got some students that were pretty damn smart. And I'm not even necessarily fans of his students either, but I'm fans of the ideas that they proposed. Some of them. Uh, and so two of his students that I really resonated deeply with because they took aspects of his work that he wasn't willing to dive too deep into and expanded greatly upon them. You have Carl Jung and Wilhelm Reich. Carl Jung took the psyche to the spirit and he spoke of the numinous. He came up with all different types of way to describe God. He might not have used the word God, but he was talking about God and he dived deep into all spiritual traditions and religions and rituals and ceremony and symbol to understand the psyche. And when you go that deep as he did, you can't help but to end up with God. And so Carl Jung speaks of God in his own language. Wilhelm Reich, who we'll come back to maybe later today or at a different time, is where I learned about bioenergetics, and he took it to the body. He took it to the base. He took it to our bestial nature as sexual beings. And so everything uh, that the way Jung described everything was existentially. The way Reich described everything was biologically. And so I became a, a big fan of both of them. When it comes to this quadrated psyche that was proposed by Jung, 
He described it in terms of what is available to us. There's only four modes. Thinking, feeling, doing, and being. Thinking, feeling, doing, and being. Thinking, feeling, doing, and being. And so thinking, feeling, doing, and being kind of covers every aspect of what's available to us. Are you either thinking, are you doing, are you feeling, or the most mystical of all, which is associated with the king, is being. The king is pure being. And so anyway, it doesn't stop there because that's fascinating. That's interesting. He even created all kinds of uh, tools by which we could see which part of those four we tend to excel or tend to suck in, right? We got people who are hyper thinkers, very strong in the thinking category that just can't do a damn thing, right? How many keyboard warriors are out there? Raise your hand. Come on, you know who you are. Big talkers, big thinkers, know everything. Don't do a damn thing about it. I'd say that's probably the brain cramp of our day. I'd say that's probably where we most struggle and stray is into the world of thought, right? Because the world we live in today is essentially the manifestation of a cloud reality. Even you watching me right now, this is coming, beaming down to you from some cloud. So we literally live in a cloud where high flyers, thinkers, and 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 then feelers, right? How many, how, how perverted has our world become in the worship of feeling? So much so that I can't believe this is even true. I, Tell me if this is a conspiracy theory or not, because I tend to believe in conspiracy theories because they usually end up true. That there are schools in which teachers will ask children what they feel about mathematical equations, meaning two plus two equals four. Johnny, what do you feel about that? Feeling is totally subjective and has no real basis in reality. And it doesn't mean that feelings aren't valuable, but it means that we can't make them true because they're subjective. Just because you feel like that's your truth don't make it true. Just because you feel something doesn't mean that the world needs to accommodate that, right? This is where the whole silliness of transgenderism, transgenderism, transgenderism comes in. I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that word because it hurts some people's feelings and I might get banned on YouTube or whatever, right? That's how silly it is. I feel like a woman. Well, that's fine, but why should other people have to succumb to your psychosis? Just because you feel like something don't mean we gotta, do we have to bow down and kowtow to your <laughs> wacky feelings, right? But where we are in a world right now with the feeling body, the feeling aspect of being is that we worship feeling. So we got thinkers, we got feelers, we also got doers. And I'd like to sort of, I don't know. I don't know. I kind of I kind of bounce around with all of them, but the doers are the people that are constantly actively getting involved with things. And I'm talking about these in in, in the imbalanced way, because there's a way to balance all this so that it makes sense. But doers are those who I like to say get steeped in activity but never take any action. I got a lot of guys, a lot of my students that struggle with this, where you're needing to figure out what to do in your life so that you do basically anything and you get real busy doing a bunch of stuff that yields no result. Does that sound familiar? Anxiously and actively getting a lot of nothing done. I'm busy with busyness, but I'm not creating any results. And so there's an antidote to that. There's an antidote to all these problems. Uh, one of the things that I like to say to my guys when it comes to really taking action versus getting steeped in activity is that every action is measured by the sentiment from which it proceeds. Meaning that all activity is born out of fear because you can't, because you have this angst, you have this anxiety, you have this sense that you need to feverishly get fucking with things. That's my first F-bomb. So, because it rhymed, I like alliteration. And so you end up just feverishly effing around with stuff, but never actually get anything done because the sentiment from which it's proceeding is fear. Fear, fellas. 
most of us seeming action takers, and I put that in air quotes because like I said, it's activity, are moving out of a place of fear. But real action, real doing, is it proceeds from a place of stillness. Real action proceeds out of a place of faith. Real action is what you see with me and you face to face right here. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I came here with no plan. I have a piece of paper here just so if there's anything that I forget or anything, if I run out of stuff to say that I can go to my paper, but I'm taking pure action right now because I haven't thought too much about this. When I was a fearful man, I would over plan. I would overthink. I would try too hard. But one of my teachers told me this, man, and it's still, I still struggle with it. She said, Elliot, don't do anything until you're doing it. Damn. <laughs> Think about the simplistic wisdom of that. And then I say to her, well, then how will I know what to do if I wait till I'm doing it to doing it? And you know what her answer was? Because you'll be doing it. <laughs> how will I know what to do when it's time to do it? Because you'll be doing it. That was her answer to me. And I still, I still, I still marvel at the profundity of that statement. Don't do it until you're doing it. Don't cross the bridge until you get to it, right? So just a little advice for our doers out there. And then being, bro, what is that? What is it to be? Well, before I get into what it is to be, let me superimpose mystical language about uh, upon these four. Because this is where we get the language I use today to describe the different ways of uh, four. We have the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover. Boy, I love this stuff. And um, may Robert Moore, PhD, rest in peace. He's the man that wrote the book that gave me this insight in a time when I was very much in need of it because I was going through a initiation in life boy i want to talk about initiation too man i want to talk about the different phases of life and how to know where you are and how to navigate those boy maybe we'll get to that today or maybe you'll just have to listen to these podcasts for me to pour all that stuff out on you king warrior magician lover so what do we have thinkers magician magician mind living in the existential, living in the mind, living in the thought world, the symbol world, right? Magician, living in the clouds, right? Keyboard warriors are no warriors at all. They're magicians, right? And so they're, they, they're seemingly creating magic with their fingers, right? Magical, mystical stuff through the tapping of keys, Ooh. And you know what? It's real because all you need is a keyboard warrior to type the right words by tapping the right fingers with his, tapping the right keys with his magical fingers. And you know what he could do? Touch you, right? Have you ever read a comment from someone who doesn't like you and it hurts your feelings? That's a magician <laughs> spitting it out to you, right? A dark magician, right? We have, um, we have, we have the positive and negative aspects of each of these. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of harping in on the negative right now because when we speak of the negative, then it's much easier to uh, draw contrast. So we got the thinker, the magician aspect of man. We have the feeler, the lover, right? Lover, feeler. You know what the feeler is in its perverted form? The feeler is an addict. Robert Moore says, wherever there is an addiction, there is a wounded lover. Because it's that sense of comfort that we get from addiction to what? Weed, right? I'm familiar with that one. Or alcohol or video games or pornography and jerking off, uh, scrolling through screens and the dopamine hits that are associated with all the things that keep us trapped. Wherever there's an addiction, there's a wounded lover in. Who here is not an addicted, uh, not a wounded lover in some way, shape, or form? We're wounded from birth. 
were wounded from since that first love object relationship break with the mother. And so there's usually a lot of mommy attachment associated with the addicted lover, with the wounded lover, with the unresourceful manifestation of the lover. And it has a lot to do with uh, our lack of initiation for men in our society. Lack of, a of masculine initiation leads to a lot of addicted lovers and mama boys. And so a part of making men strong again is about slapping that addicted lover. And then we have the wounded warrior, right? We have the unresourceful warrior. And with each of these, boy, there's, we have to go so deep with each one of them, but I got to remember that we're just keeping this broad today. Uh, well, with the lover, with the with the warrior, I already spoke about the the masochist, right? The guy who's just punishing himself to get shit done. The guy who's just I'm just going, 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 going with really no devotion. When the warrior doesn't have a higher calling, when he doesn't have a devotion, when he's not devoted to the to the transcendent other then he's a mercenary, right? He's just working for the sake of working just to beat himself up, to make him think that he's getting somewhere. But then you also have the, 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 the negative aspect of the lover or, or the uh, warrior, and that's the guy who doesn't get anything done at all, right? We have the negative aspect of each of those too, right? Like you got the addicted lover who is, that's in his positive, his, po his dark positive aspect, but we also have the uh, impotent lover, the guy who can't give love. He's numb, right? Impotent, right? Can't get stiff. Can't, can't get it up. Got nothing to love with, right? And then finally, the king. And so the reason why I took a step back before getting to the being aspect is because the king is so damn mystical that he wears a crown that points up. It's almost like the crown is a sort of antenna of sorts. The crown points up so that it can draw down because it is, the, it is through the king that blessings pour into the world. The king aspect is your generative aspect. It's the part of you that brings God's kingdom through you into the world, creating order. The king is the ordering aspect, but you might say, well, then don't I have to do stuff? to create order? Don't I have to think through the order? Shouldn't my emotional body be associated in this through passion to create order? And I say no. I say no. The way you know the king is through the negative of the first three. You know you're accessing your inner king and you're being a conduit for God when you're not thinking. That's why I'm not thinking today. I'm just spitting. I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak through me today, and that's what we're doing right now. I'm not thinking about anything. I'm seeing what flows. Am I tapping into my king? Who knows? You might say so. The king is not feeling, because feelings pervert. Like I said before, can you get to the truth if you're too focused on the chemical cascade of dopamine and serotonin in your brain? You can't think straight. Emotions cloud reality. They cloud your thinking, and even thinking can get perverted. Your thinking can get easily get perverted. I know mine can. That's why I have to guard my eyes and ears. Listen to the music that the culture is pumping into your brain, and then recognize the kind of conversations that you have yourself have with yourself. Can't trust your thinking either. Can't trust your feeling. Damn sure can't trust your doing because, like they say. You could be climbing the ladder, but if you find out that it's against the wrong wall, well, then all the movement was for nothing. And your doing is going to proceed from your thinking and your feeling. And if your thinking and your feeling are perverted, then what you do is of no use. To tap into the king, to tap into being, to draw down celestial power, God power, blessings from above, we got to get out of the way. We got to get our three lower bodies out of the way. We got to get our fallen nature out of the way. And there's a myriad of ways to go about that. But it all 
points back to this, being a king in your life. There's no king where there's an addiction. There's no king where there's anxiety. There's no king where there's overthinking. There's king only where there is being. And how do you know when you're being? Because you're not thinking, you're not feeling, and you're not doing. It's so interesting because we've lost so much of this mystical language. And of course, I have my theories and reasons why we lost mystical language. You know, we threw religion, we threw mysticism, we threw uh, symbol and spirit and meaning and pattern, father, all out the window with the so-called enlightenment, which I call the endarkenment, because we got so smart that we forgot who we are during the endarkenment, right? And they like to call the dark ages, the middle ages, they like to call the dark ages, but the dark ages or the middle ages were actually very light because we relied on what spirit, God, the drawing down of the blessings from above. And so in this mystical language that our ancestors understood that, you know, postmodern man has eschewed and thrown off, there's a understanding that if this, if, if the king doesn't bring blessings into his kingdom, then, well, he's got to die. And that's why they say heavy is the head that wears a crown, because a king, there is no king without a sacrifice. He might have to go. And so when they would say long live the king, it's because not because they love the king, it's because of the blessings that he brings in, right? And look at the fallen kings that we have ruling our worlds today. Look at a Joe Biden, right? And I don't even, look, I don't even blame him. I blame the entire American corporate system that we're in, right? The, the, the bank-owned world that we live in, right? The, the true fascist world that we live in, we're ruled by, by demons, people that, don't, that aren't kings. There aren't true kings. Where is the king? Where is the king drawing down blessings? Oh, boy. And so it's amazing because we can all tap into that. We can all be that. We can all get out of our own way. And like my mother would say, let go and let God. She would often say, lay it at the cross of Christ. Vivo Cristo Rey. Long live Christ the King. And so there's Christ's mission in your life. Christ is king. But what does that mean? Man, well, that's another rabbit hole we could go down. But if there's no Christ in your life, there's no king in your life. And if there's no Christ in your life, the false kings of Hollywood, sports celebrities, uh, politicians, or, or fornication and masturbation, and addiction to screens and drugs and alcohol and having a good time. All these things become your God. My feelings become my God. One thing that men need is a standard by which to live by. Christ gives us the standard and God gives us Christ. So there's a way and it's an amazing way. It's a, it's a freedom way. It's a mystical way. It's the way, and that's what the early Christians called them, called it, following the way. So maybe that's all I have to say today. What will this show be about? What will I go on about? It'll probably be something associated with all four of those things. And that basically covers everything. But I will leave you with this. It will be colored by my mission always and that is to make men strong again. That looks a lot like traditional masculinity. It looks a lot like fatherhood and family. It looks a lot like fitness and finances and faith. It looks a lot like me. I guess we'll call this the Elliot Hull Show. And so that's it. That's all. Oh, Uncle E, I'm out.